I will next invite um, uh, Rahul Kashyap uh, to tell us about uh, prompt collapse uh, of binary, you know, the remnant that forms from binary neutron stars and what we can learn from such events. Uh, Rahul, would you like to share your screen yeah. and get going? Yeah, we yeah. can see uh, your screen. You can see yeah, screen. we can okay. hear you. Thank you, please okay. go ahead. Okay, thank you, Satya. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, organizers to, for inviting me to present my work here. So, uh, so I'll be presenting this work, uh, uh, which we finished uh, in our numerical literacy group at Penn State here uh, recently. And it has gone through uh, two reviews and it's, uh, it's on the archive, so you can go through there. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about the binary neutron star mergers in general, but also uh, a very specific event that follows binary neutron star merger, which is we are calling prompt collapse events. So before going into the, the, uh, the numerical study that we have done here, I'll just talk about the just single neutron stars. So uh, uh, when when we when we think about neutron stars, the the most out, outstanding question currently is is to find the correct equation state uh, that describes the nuclear matter at densities at nuclear densities and uh, above nuclear densities, and mostly because those are the uh, conditions that we can do, we cannot achieve uh, in laboratory, uh, and uh, those are our only avenues to probe such physics. So uh, a single neutron star. Uh, is uh, uh, is described by a uh, tolman oppenheimer volkov equations uh, in in general relativity uh, uh, in the, in the approximation of it is which is spherically symmetric and static uh, and uh, uh, a, a single uh, equation state is described by a pressure density relation here uh, so here i have plotted many uh, equation state which are now uh, which used to be uh, named uh, on after their discoveries but now People are using the nuclear parameters to generate new equation states or different uh, parameterizations, and so which are just numbered here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And for corresponding to each of these equation state uh, curves here, we obtain a mass radius curve and a mass tidal deformability curve. So the tidal deformability is the uh, is the polarizability of neutron star when you put it in a in a tidal field of another neutron star. And that uh, uh, quantity uh, changes the gravitational waves compared to the point particle uh, in spiral and they uh, and can be measured in gravitational wave uh, data uh, analysis uh, if using the events so one caveat here is that we are not using any uh, rotation when we model uh, neutron star in this in this case however there are equations uh, for rotating neutron stars also uh, involving another parameter which is the total angular momentum uh, that are there, but we uh, are uh, not going. Uh, we are not doing that in this study. So we are just studying uh, the study. We are studying the numerical simulations and their outcomes in the light of spherically symmetric and static neutron stars. So, so now I'll briefly describe the binary neutron star mergers. So uh, here is a picture of a few snapshots of uh, full general relativistic. Uh, sorry, there was a question. Okay, so so here is a picture of uh, full uh, generativistic simulations of uh, binary neutron star, and uh, as we can see that uh, first these neutron star come in contact with each other, and then a uh, uh, very violent uh, merger happens, uh, which involves uh, a very nonlinear evolution of the fluids along with the space time uh, variables, and then uh, after. Uh, and uh, after the merger finishes over a few milliseconds uh, there is a uh, there is a remnant that uh, that is left because of the strong gravity and there is a lot of material that is ejected out so uh, so uh, but these neutron stars are in spiraling for a very long time and uh, and they emit gravitational waves that's why they come close to each other so uh, but the but the uh, gravitational wave frequency of these uh, binary neutron stars uh, when they enter the ligo band when they become observable uh, uh, for us uh, uh, after that uh, in uh, uh, it it it, uh, it spends uh, about uh, a few minutes uh, and then uh, we see several cycles uh, of the in spiral uh, but within the last uh, uh, few seconds 
uh, there is a lot of uh, phenomena that is going on, which we are still trying to understand via detailed numerical simulations. So first it plunges towards each other. So there is a relative velocity of neutron stars towards each other, uh, which is very different from the in-spiral phase where the relative velocity is very small. So it's a quasi-circular uh, in, in the quasi-circular orbit. Uh, and because of the uh, high velocity and also a strong uh, tidal field, the neutron star gets disrupted and it forms a, something called tidal tail, which is also observed in binary white dwarf mergers or binary uh, uh, or any kind, kind of tidal disruption events that you see because of the black holes. Uh, and then, uh, then during, uh, after the merger, then some uh, physical phenomena happens, which we are still trying to understand. And then we obtain a gamma ray burst, uh, a short gamma ray burst from this event, uh, which has been first uh, uh, verified by GW1717 observation. And, and because of this relative velocity, there is a shock which travels through the fluid and the ejected and the tidal tail. And uh, this shock again causes heating and, uh, and also expansion of the, of the material. And, uh, and whatever is uh, remnant is left uh, and the disc uh, around it, which forms also evaporates on a very short time scale uh, around a second. And then we are left with some remnant, which could be also neutron star or black hole. Uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then this expanding material, which is expanding because of the shock, uh, expands over 14 orders of magnitude within a day. And, uh, and this expanding material, which used to be just pure neutron and some other heavy uh, particles, and uh, which became uh, a very neutron rich uh, radioactive elements, and then they decay. And the decay of that radioactive element uh, then converts to uh, optical uh, band and a near optical band. And then that's what we see and that we what we call kilonoa. <clears throat> and uh, this ejecta then uh, over months time scale then interacts with the interstellar medium and then produces X-ray and radio waves. Uh, and for years, we can see the radio observations of these, uh, this ejecta which interacts with the interstellar medium. Uh, so this picture, which has been known by the numerical simulations, uh, have been uh, have been amazingly verified uh, by the LVC observations of GW1717. So, so to summarize uh, uh, the the various outcomes that is possible, uh, as we are seeing here that there is a binary neutron star uh, here, uh, and uh, uh, when uh, during the merger, depending upon the initial masses, it can go to either black hole. Uh, at several different stages, uh, as I described, when it forms the uh, compact remnant and then it uh, evolves uh, due to the viscosity of neutrino and the fluid. Uh, but if the masses are, component masses are very small, then it will just simply form a stable neutron star at the end. Uh, so our study here is to find out that what kind of conditions uh, in terms of equation state, that is pressure density curves, causes this a remnant to promptly collapse. That means the first pathway to follow. Uh, and uh, what can we do? What can we learn from uh, doing the numerical simulations to constrain uh, and general observation to constrain the properties of those equation states? So, so one thing I want to describe uh, real briefly is that since uh, equation state uh, is a very complicated uh, concept for equilibrium fluid, but uh, 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 but loosely, sometimes people just use pressure density curve at zero temperature. Uh, but uh, sometimes you'll also see more simplification, which is just uh, equation state model. When people talk about, they just talk about mass radius curves. So, and this is the uh, point of view that we will take in this uh, in, in this take that uh, the mass radius curves and various properties of the mass radius curves uh, characterize equation state. So, for example, what is the maximum mass for certain equation state? What is the radius of 1.4 solar mass neutron star and so on, uh, which could be uh, common between two different equation states. So it's a very degenerate concept, but uh, this, is, uh, this has been used uh, in literature and it provides us very useful constraints. So that's what we will see. So we do simulations, uh, numerical simulations of binary neutron star mergers. So in this picture here, mass radius curves of various equation states are plotted. And we take binary neutron stars with the same masses. So mass ratio is one. And uh, each, each black dots are the one uh, which masses are, are simulated. And the red are the one where we see the boundary of the prompt collapse and uh, delayed collapse. So, so if your masses are below this red 
point, then we see delayed collapse. It doesn't collapse promptly. Uh, but if the masses are above that, then it collapses promptly. So that's the, the, the red points for uh, each of these systems and two times that, because that is the total mass of the system is what we call the threshold mass. So how do we define prompt collapse in, in numerical relativity simulations? So here are the here are three different cases, three different simulations that we did uh, with different equation state and masses. Uh, and these are the three typical outcomes that we monitor uh, for the time evolution that we simulate. So as you can see that this is uh, about seven millisecond of simulations. And this itself takes about uh, 1000 uh, CP processors for, for uh, about uh, four to five days to simulate uh, uh, this uh, for one system. And we, de we do about 200 such systems to find out the threshold boundary for many equation states. So, so the first panel here is, uh, uh, shows the minimum lapse uh, uh, in, in the domain, uh, uh, first row, and the second row shows the maximum density, and the third row shows the gravitational wave strain. So as you can see that uh, the, the last row, the gravitational wave strain, and the, and the second row are the uh, uh, invariant uh, quantities which are plotted, but the first uh, quantity lapse, which is not the invariant quantity, uh, but uh, but we see, see correlations in, in different uh, uh, quantities here that uh, after uh, what we call the merger, where when the lapse starts dropping uh, and the gravitational wave strain become almost zero, we see a post-merger in the first uh, column, but we don't see post-merger in the last column. Uh, so so uh, by looking at the invariant quantity, uh, if, if we want to do that in gravitational waves, we identify systems which doesn't have post-merger, uh, uh, we call them gravitational uh, prompt collapse events, and which has the long post-merger or the delayed collapse. Uh, but there is also a boundary case where uh, the, the lapse oscillates only once and then it collapses, and we see just a very small post-merger. So we, we just wanted to describe that there is a variation in numerical simulations because of the full generality and, and the nonlinear linearity. Uh, but we just make the boundary between prompt and any other collapse that is the the first two columns are called delayed collapse. Uh, and these have been uh, verified by uh, looking at the numerical simulations very, uh, you know, very carefully, where you, you find the parent horizon at very small, on a very small time step, and then you uh, decide that, yeah, this is indeed a direct collapse and forms a black hole. So, and because of the prompt collapse, not only the gravitational wave strain post merger is is lacking, but also matter, which uh, which generally gets ejected because of the because of the oscillation, also becomes very small, and we we are expect to see very dim electromagnetic counterpart for these events, and that will be another probe for detecting such events. So so what we do from the, so how do we connect numerical simulations to equation state? So so the essential idea is that. That for each of the equation state, we will have a threshold mass that is boundary between the uh, prompt and delayed collapse. And we also know the maximum mass of each equation state. So uh, we propose a relation that if the maximum mass increases for a equation state, then of course its threshold mass will, should also increase uh, to, to, to form black hole. And uh, to, to a very low order, we just uh, propose a linear relationship. And this proportionality constant itself is uh, is uh, hypothesized to to uh, to have a real relationship with the maximum compactness, and this is for the same equation state. Uh, and you can see that uh, the if you use the definition of the maximum compactness in this expression of threshold mass and invert it, then we we'll, you'll get a maximum radius value as a function of two variables, which is threshold mass and the a max and then a and b are the fitting coefficients that we, we we will do from numerical simulations so c max is coming from tov equations for any equation state and k threshold is coming from the our numerical simulations so this is the connection between numerical simulations and uh, uh, analytical analytical models on neutron stars and uh, the, then we can plot this uh, r max so first i'll just uh, briefly describe that the 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 correlation between k threshold and c max uh, uh, is also plotted previously in the literature and we see some systematic deviation uh, and that's uh, mostly because the previous simulations has not been done using full three plus one uh, NR simulations, but there's some approximations to GR. 
Okay, so so this radius, which is a function of two variables, threshold mass and M max, is plotted here as a color bar, as a constant. R max contours are plotted. Uh, again, here we do not take a, uh, a rotation into account because that will increase one more uh, variable. Uh, so we can do it. We will look at it in the future. So so uh, by looking at this figure, you can clearly see that uh, the maximum radius that is proposed here is it goes up to twenty kilometers and so on. And threshold mass is also going very high values. Uh, of course, th there is a region of this space which is not allowed, and we simply know this because we have observed uh, pulsar masses uh, about two solar masses. So, if you start putting those constraints uh, on this uh, plot, so just a minute, sorry. Yeah. So, so if you start putting those constraints uh, uh, on this uh, on this plot, then first we'll plot that the heaviest pulsar observed is two solar masses. So, so, everything left of this vertical line will be ruled out. Uh, then GW seventy node seventy now is believed to be that is a prompt collapse event. So that means the threshold mass has to be larger than uh, the mass of the seventy node seventy. Uh, so everything below is that is also ruled out. So it's shaded. Uh, another uh, interesting fact, uh, which is phenomenological, is that there is exists a maximum compactness of uh, of neutron stars. And once you use the uh, compactness in this relation, then you'll see that the threshold mass also has to be greater than uh, some re linear relationship with the M max. So that gives you this green dotted curve. So everything below this is also ruled out. Now, uh, so so this much uh, was known before. Uh, the improvement that we did uh, was that we, we did the full NR simulation. So that provided us better uh, accurate coefficients. Uh, but there was another improvement that we did, which is that, uh, that from phenomenological, so, sorry about this. Yeah, so uh, so there there is a phenomenological constraints on neutron star sequences that can be done by sampling in pressure density space. So you sample different pressure density curves and then you obtain mass radius curves. And here they are colored according to the maximum sound speed uh, for such neutron stars. And uh, and by by simulating uh, millions of such pressure density curves, which satisfy some criteria. Uh, of uh, you know maximum mass is greater than two solar mass uh, and uh, and GW seventeen or seventeen constraints also. Uh, so then you observe, uh, then you uh, then you have uh, so many mass radius curves. So then you can plot the bounds on that. So 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 then uh, by once you plot those each of these dots uh, here are the are one equation state uh, sampled in pressure density curve, and then you see that there is a bound on the radius uh, and the compactness correspondingly uh, for given maximum mass. So we uh, we translated this curve uh, onto this curve. Uh, sorry, this is jumbled. So so we translate these bounds for phenomenological constraints on this space uh, that we obtained from the numerical simulations. And then we find that, uh, uh, then we find that uh, there exists a minimum and the maximum threshold mass for each of the maximum mass, which depends on the maximum mass. It's, it's not independent of that. Uh, and uh, when you plot all uh, both constraints, the maximum and the minimum compactness bounds, then you see that there is a small region of uh, here, which is only allowed uh, in, this, in this space. And the boundary of that, the constant R max contour that crosses through that bounds this white region are the uh, constraints on the maximum radius. So, so, so far so good. Uh, so that means our, so the statement here is that the maximum radius, uh, radius of the maximum mass neutron star has to be between 14 kilometer and 9.82 kilometer. Uh, so here I'm, I'm uh, just uh, uh, hypothesizing or like uh, thinking about some future observations, some hypothetical events, uh, which we observe and then we see it, uh, we know it by gravitational wave observation that it is prompt collapse. So for example, if you observe a three solar mass event and it is delayed collapse, then just like 17 or 17 below region will be shredded. Similarly, uh, but uh, as you can see that this doesn't rule out any extra uh, uh, region of M max, but once it goes above this uh, region, for example, 3.3 uh, solar mass, then it starts constraining the maximum mass from below. And similarly from prompt collapse event. So if we start seeing prompt collapse event of uh, some lower masses, then we will start constraining the maximum mass from upper side. 
uh, and th there are lots of possibilities of observing such events, which is shown here in the left plot. So it is a corner plot of distributions that we will ex we are expecting in uh, in uh, in uh, future uh, detector combinations, uh, which combines uh, 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 which includes the current uh, LIGO Virgo handful detectors along with Kagra and India and uh, uh, its plus configurations. So then you can see that uh, there is a uh, at least 200 events with greater than SNR greater than 10, uh, which is uh, two to 300 events, which is uh, expected to be observed. And with masses around 1.7 and 1.4, which is going around this region. So we definitely expect that this method can be uh, used to constrain or put the bounds on the maximum mass. Okay. so. So this is our summary of constraints that we not only put the event masses above which when observed, we, it will give us constraint, but also on the threshold masses. Then we also do some other uh, fitting just like this. Uh, the, and this has this has been done in the literature in the past also said so that you know you can fit try to fit the threshold mass with respect to maximum mass and tidal deformity of 1.4 solar mass Newton star. And that gives you Again, by putting different kinds of constraints from phenomenological and 17 or 17, we see that there is a region here uh, which uh, which is allowed. So this again gives you the lower bound of uh, tidal deformity of 1.4 solar mass, uh, which is very interesting uh, quantity because and you will wonder why 1.4 solar mass. Uh, that's because the the tidal deformity and radius of 1.4 solar mass corresponds to the pressure at uh, two times saturation density. And this has been done by Latimer, uh, Jim Latimer and Dr. Paprakash uh, uh, very early. So, uh, so these are very interesting quantities which can be used to know the properties of Newton star. So here uh, with the 17 or 17 observations, our work on the uh, lower bound of the R max uh, is greatly improved. Uh, I should emphasize that our, our errors are larger because we take the uncertainties of uh, gravitational wave event as well as the slopes into account. Uh, there are uh, lots of implications of this. Uh, of course, uh, by observing different events, we will know that uh, we'll begin constraining the radius of maximum mass and also a different kind of, con uh, of correlations you can do, which also constraints the radius of 1.4 and 1.6 solar mass neutron stars. Uh, and they, and they, we are also looking uh, into gravitational wave uh, uh, like gravitational wave data analysis, which constrains the radii of the neutron star using only gravitational wave data. So without using the, uh, uh, thank you, minutes. thank you. Uh, so so uh, uh, just to advertise our work here, we uh, we will uh, we are looking at how to constrain the radius, how to find the radii of the neutron star, and what are their future prospects in upcoming uh, uh, detector, uh, very sensitive gravitational wave observations observatories. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, the the numerical simulations uh, gives us a nonlinear uh, results of, uh, of of certain equation states, which is not possible through analytical methods. Uh, and uh, and such correlations, uh, after doing the full numerical simulations, uh, uh, contains uh, uh, the uh, like can provide us like constraints which is not otherwise possible. Uh, so so uh, we will. Uh, uh, so our work here uh, will be uh, uh, can be improved by you know further numerical simulations or with a different equation state as you can see here for example in this plot there is a lot of space which is missing so uh, by uh, sampling in more equations more equation state this can be improved uh, and uh, we will also look at the rotation we'll, once you include the rotation the, into this picture then that will give you the realistic uh, constraint on the star so so thank you that's all Okay, thank you very much, Rahul. Yeah. I invite people to open their mic and uh, clap for the record. Okay. Thank you. All right, I see Arun has raised his hand. Please go ahead, Arun. Yeah, hi. Uh, mm. uh, hi, Rahul. Thanks for a great, great summary. So you mentioned uh, you. somewhere that there are some electromagnetic signatures of uh, the prompt uh, the prompt collapse is it, so yes what will be what will they be so 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 their signature will be simply that they they will not be observed uh, so so the caveat here is that 
you can you will you can fail to see the electrometry counterpart by because of the other reasons also because it's very far uh, or uh, there was something or you couldn't detect it uh, in time because of, of uh, you know uh, because we cannot see everywhere all the time so yeah so so its signature is the absence which is not very great avenue <laughs> I agree. Yeah. No, but you said 70 nodes, 17 is a wrong. Um, no, so I got confused with your terminology, maybe. Did you say so? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. I, maybe I misspoke. So 17 nodes, 17 was delayed collapse. So, ah, okay. uh, so, so that means the threshold mass has to be greater than this. That's why the lower regions are ruled out. Ah, fine. Okay. So I, I just got confused with the terminology. Yeah. yeah I, maybe, maybe I misspoke. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, about that point, uh, Rahul, hmm. it, it may be possible to observe events that are um, nearby and loud even before the merger occurs and well localized. And I hmm. wonder um, how well do we know about uh, the prompt collapse, uh, especially the afterglows, to say the level at which the kilonova might occur or not occur, uh, because it, with future detectors for nearby mm -hmm. events, by that I mean even within redshift of one, we'll be able to localize many, many events mm -hmm. uh, before the, uh, sorry, before the collapse uh, occurs even, even before the merger. Yeah. In yeah. that case, you you are not left with oh you know I cannot observe because they are within let's say redshift of 0.5 and you have a lesser speed. You should be able to constrain these things. Yeah, I mean the main thing is that if you have uh, got early warning and then you got enough time to slew the region where it is expected to be, and if you still don't see, then uh, I can I think it can be formulated probabilistically uh, that uh, whether it is prompt collapse or not. Yeah, and that uh, that definitely one should not miss those events or, or such ways to constrain. Yes. Okay, are there any other questions for us? Be raising a hand. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. If you uh, no, want to ask. I already partly asked by bias. Okay. 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 Nice. Okay, Thank you. Uh, if not, let's thank Rahul again. Thank you.